It's time for another BortsCast. Happy Friday, everybody. Happy weekend. If you've delayed listening to this, another BortsCast. And it's another BortsCast from the Canyon Ranch Health and Fitness Resort, Tucson, Arizona. My wife and I, as I've told you, we're members. We've been coming here for, uh, well, over 20 years. Not exactly how long, I don't remember. But it's usually one week or more. We're spending two weeks here this year. All this exercise, all these walks, eh, just feeling great. You know, typical day here is that I'm up at about 6 o'clock. I head over to the spa, relax, drink a cup of coffee, because at 7 o'clock, the walks depart. Heading out into the desert for a 30-minute, 40-minute, 50-minute walk. Pretty good pace, 15-minute 15, uh, 15 miles or better, down to 13-minute miles. And then it's uh, back. I join the queen for breakfast. And then maybe some more aerobics, work with the weights, attend some lectures. Every afternoon at 2 o'clock, it's another walk. This one I do 40 minutes, a faster pace, up and down a lot of hills. Just love this place. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get on with it. I have something a bit amusing. <laughs> I would like to see some company try this now. So let me hit you with this first. It's from the Singer Sewing Machine Company. Do you know I actually used to have a sewing machine? It was the first wife, the Kunas, the Cajun, uh, that I married. A mistake didn't last long. Anyway, she wanted a sewing machine. I bought her a sewing machine. She never used it. So to humiliate her, I decided to learn how to use it. And I actually made my shirts and my neckties on that sewing machine and haven't touched one since. But anyway, in 1949, when the Singer Company, when they put out a sewing machine, they had a manual. And on the first page of the manual, ladies, listen to this. On the first page of the manual, this is what it said. This is what you were supposed to do before you actually started sewing. From the manual, prepare yourself mentally for sewing. Think about what you're going to do. Never approach sewing with a sigh or lackadaisically. Good results are difficult when indifference dominates. Never try to sew with a sink full of dirty dishes or beds that are unmade. When there are urgent housekeeping chores, do these first so that your mind is free to enjoy your sewing. When you sew, Make yourself as attractive as possible. Put on a clean dress. Keep a little bag of French chalk near your sewing machine to dust your fingers at intervals. Have your hair in order, powder, and lipstick put on. If you are constantly fearful that a visitor might drop in or your husband will come home and you will not look neatly put together, you will not enjoy your sewing. Gotta love that. I... I, think the Singer Company probably still sells sewing machines, but I rather doubt that you'll find those instructions right there at the beginning of the manual. Okay, first out of the block, we'll make this short. Mass shooting, Kansas. James Dalton, 45 years old, randomly is accused, randomly shooting and killing six people, severely windy, uh, wounding two more outside a restaurant, a car dealership, and an apartment building in Uh, Kansas. Heston, Kansas, actually uh, a little area north of Wichita. Here was somebody with a lengthy criminal record, somebody who was not legally entitled to buy a gun or to carry a gun. He had just been served with a restraining order uh, to keep him away from his girlfriend, and apparently he went nuts. And the left is going to do the same thing, going nuts right now about, well, we need gun control. I want to tell you another story of another workplace, a man I know in Georgia. His name is Lance Toland. Now, in Kansas, these shootings took place at a a gun-free zone, a gun-free workplace where people were told they are not allowed to have their firearms even if they have a concealed weapons permit. The mainstream media is not going to report this, but the prevalence of so-called mass shootings over the last couple of years have occurred in gun-free zones. Now, Lance Tolan is in the business of selling aviation insurance in Georgia. 
I see his office every time I drive out of the DeKalb Peachtree Airport. He has another office, I believe, in Griffin and in Savannah. He had an employee with a concealed weapons permit that would always have his gun with him at work. That employee is no longer there. Frankly, I forgot whether he passed on or just retired, but Lance Tolan kind of felt a little vulnerable without anybody in the office that had a gun. So he told his employees, he has 12 of them, he told his employees, if you get a concealed carry permit, I will buy you a gun and I will invite you and ask you to carry that gun with you when you are at work. All of his employees got the permit. He bought every one of them a revolver. It's called the Taurus Judge. It'll shoot a 410 shotgun shell or I think a 45 caliber bullet. But I want to ask you this. How soon do you think it's going to be before anybody walks in to one of Lance Tolan's insurance companies and tries to rob the place or tries to get even with an employee with whom they have some sort of a personal vendetta? It ain't going to happen. Now I ask you to draw this comparison. Two different workplaces, okay? Same general type of business, same number of employees, same area of town. Let's make them as similar as we possibly can, except for one thing on the front door of the workplace. On one, there is a sign saying, this is a gun-free zone. Firearms are prohibited. On the other workplace, it has a sign saying, employees are armed and will defend themselves. Which logic, logic, folks, which one of those places is more likely to have a shooting? Which one? And you know the answer. Intuitively, instinctively, you know the answer. Remember, when seconds count, 911 and the police are only minutes away. Okay, now we're going to get to last night's... uh, Last night's so-called debate. Watched every minute it, minute of it. Uh, tweeted it. I got a lot. I my followers on Twitter went up by about a thousand yesterday, of people who liked what I was tweeting and I was using the hashtag, so they were drawn to it. That's a good way to add followers to Twitter. I wish I could add them to the Bortscast as easily. But anyway, here are some of my reactions from last night's debate. And you're going to hear a somewhat, I don't think, confused, but you're going to hear a Neil Bortz here that I just am having trouble really figuring out how I feel about this whole Republican race right now. Some things haven't changed. My preferred candidate, the one that I want to win, is Marco Rubio. I believe he's probably the smartest. I think he is the most capable of all the candidates of handling difficult situations with difficult people, whether they're domestic or foreign. And above all, I believe that more than any other candidate, and I'm not accusing any of these candidates of not loving America, but more than any other candidate, Marco Rubio has a deep love and affection for the United States. And damn it, that's something we need after seven and a half years of a president who does now and always has despised the United States of America. We have a president right now, this jerk Obama, who every day in the White House giggles to himself, laughs at himself. He's so proud of himself. He looks into the mirror and says, what a great job you've done of conning the stupid American voters. And now what a great job you've done of bringing this country you've hated since you were a child to its knees. Putting that aside, now we have to deal with Donald Trump. The greatest power you possess as an individual, is your power to make choices. Virtually all that is good in your life and all that is bad in your life 
evolves in some manner from your exercise of your power to make choices. Now, having said that, it's really time to address your choice to support Donald Trump. Have you used your power of choice wisely after due thought, consideration, or have you used it hastily and in anger? And as I've said before, if you've made that choice in anger, I completely and absolutely understand that anger. In fact, just minutes ago, I got through reading an article that appeared today in the Wall Street Journal. Peggy Noonan. I love Peggy Noonan. Don't always agree with her, but she just has such a wonderful way of expressing thoughts. This article is Trump and the Rise of the Unprotected. I really commend it for your reading. Just go to, let's see, what is it? WSJWallStreetJournal.com and uh, look for Noonan, N-O-O-N-A-N. But she says, or writes this article about why political professionals are struggling to make sense of the world that they created. And she rightfully says that people who do politics for a living, whether they're in the media or they're reporters or political operatives, they are struggling struggling right now to understand what is happening in this Republican race for the nomination. Whereas regular people, and maybe that means you, I mean, it's nothing wrong with considering yourself to be a regular American. Regular people have already absorbed what is happening in this Republican race. Noonan writes that in America right now, it seems that only normal Regular people are capable of seeing the obvious. Last October, Peggy Noonan wrote an article about Donald Trump. She called it the five stages of Trump. It was based on the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. Uh, First, there was denial, then anger, then bargaining, then depression, then acceptance. And she says that most of the political professionals that she uh, knows right now They are between depression and acceptance when it comes to Donald Trump. But here's where Noonan really got my attention. She started talking about the protected and the unprotected people in our country. The protected people make public policy. The unprotected people have to live with that public policy, and the unprotected people are starting to push back, and they're pushing back powerfully. The protected people, she says, are the accomplished, the secure, the successful. They have power, they have access to power, and they're protected from a lot of the roughness of the world, and they are protected from the world they have created in America. She says they are figures in government, politics, the media. They live in nice neighborhoods, safe neighborhoods. Their families function. Their kids go to good schools. They've got some money. They have all the things they need to isolate them or to provide buffers between them and the world that they have created. Well, in other words, they're just insulated, insulated from the results of their own decisions. Noonan writes that one issue obviously roiling in the United States, Western Europe too, Immigration. It's the, all caps, the issue of the moment. The issue of immigration stands for the distance between government and its citizens right now. Is this resonating with you? It sure did resonate with me when I was reading the article, and she says this, immigration, this is the issue that made Donald Trump. Britain will probably leave the European Union over the issue of immigration. In Europe, immigration is only one front in that battle over the European Union, but it is the most salient because of the European refugee crisis and the failure of the protected class to address it realistically and in a way that offers safety to the unprotected. Now, if you are an unprotected American, You have limited resources, negligible access to power. 
you've absorbed some lessons from the past 20-year experience in this country from illegal immigration. You know the Democrats won't protect you. And you know the Republicans won't help you. Both parties have refused to control the border. The Republicans were afraid of being called illiberal or racist or losing a voting demographic for a generation. And the Democrats wanted to keep the issue alive to use it as a wedge against the Republicans to establish themselves as the owners of the Hispanic vote. And Americans are suffering. The unprotected are suffering from illegal immigration. It has an impact on labor, on markets, financial cost, crime, of course, and this, the sense that the rule of law in this country is collapsing, a sense that is exacerbated, if that's how you pronounce that, hell, I don't know, uh, by Obama's lack of attention and, in fact, his encouragement of illegal immigration. Now, with this illegal immigration, the protected people are doing just fine. More workers at lower wages. No effect of illegal immigration is going to hurt the protected class personally. But the unprotected have been watching this, and they've realized that the protected class is not looking out for them. And that means the protected class hasn't been looking out for the country either. Is this starting to make sense to you, what Peggy Noonan wrote? Are you starting to feel or to empathize with the unprotected class of what's happening to them because of the protected class not only ignoring the fact of illegal immigration, but promoting it because it helps them? That is where Donald Trump came from. No issue bigger than that. That's where he came from. And all he had to do, all he had to do was say, I'm going to deport them and build a wall. People didn't have to put a lot of intellectual thought into that. Is it possible? Can we really deport 11 million people? Can we really build a wall? The answer to both questions is quite probably no. But the unprotected class, the class that gave rise to Donald Trump, they don't care about the no. They care that this is the candidate who says over and over and over again that he, by God, is going to do it. You know, the protected versus the unprotected in Europe is having pretty much the same incident or the, the same effect, I should say. Citizens on the ground in Europe, in member nations, EU member nations, have come to see the European Union as a racket. It's elite people, it's protected people that are operating in isolation, looking after their own while looking down on the unprotected, looking down on the people. Here we have Angela Merkel over there in Germany. And this is the incident that tipped public opinion against Angela Merkel. It was New Year's Eve, the public square in Cologne, Germany. Packs of men said to be, as Peggy Noonan writes, recent migrants. We know that these men were Islamic migrants. They were Muslims with no respect for women, with no understanding of how women should be treated. But packs of these migrants groped and molested groups of young women. It was called a clash of cultures and all that sort of stuff. But it was wholly predictable. Anybody could have figured out that this was going to happen if they had thought about it. Eh, well, it was not the protected in Europe who were the victims. It wasn't the daughters of European Union officials or members of the Bundestag. It was middle and working class girls that were attacked by these Muslims, that were groped by these Muslims. They felt so unprotected that they didn't even immediately protest what had happened to them. They must have understood, as Peggy Noonan writes, they must have understood on some level that in the general scheme of things, they were just nobodies. We have the protected and the unprotected in America. Well, Hollywood, as Peggy Noonan writes, is a good example. Hollywood, where they sort of create our culture, don't they? But in Hollywood, they are careful to protect their own children 
from the ill effects of the culture that they promote and depict in their movies. In places with failing schools, the Hollywood protected choose not to help them through the school liberation movement, charter schools, school choice, whatever, because the Hollywood protected are afraid to go up against the most reactionary professional group in America, teachers' unions. So they let public schools, where the unprotected send their kids, they let them flounder while their kids go to the best private schools. And Noonan says it's a terrible feature of our age that we are governed by protected people who don't seem to care that much about their unprotected fellow citizens. In wise governments, the top is attentive to the realities of the lives of the normal people. That is how Donald Trump has, has climbed to his present position as the probable Republican nominee. He instinctively, I don't know how he does it, but he understands the concerns and the fears of the unprotected out there, especially on the question of immigration. And the anger over illegal immigration has been going on for years. And you know what? Either side of the aisle, Democrats or Republicans, you won't find a single senator or member of the House of Representatives that has been negatively affected in a personal way by illegal immigration. They are protected from the consequences of their, in this case, inaction. And the people are pissed. And these people up there in Washington on the left and right, the Republican so-called establishment and the Democrats, they are, pardon my French, they're scared shitless because this movement seems to be unstoppable. So now, after spending about 20 minutes here making the case for Donald Trump, really, what I was doing was explaining to you or trying to explain to you why he is where he is. And that's because the American people are pissed off. It is the unprotected who are showing up at those rallies. It is the unprotected that are showing up in huge numbers at the Nevada caucus, at the Iowa caucus, at Trump rallies, numbers that the politically protected just can't believe. How in the hell did the Nevada caucus have 150% more voters in it this year than it did the last time around? How? Because the unprotected have found a hero that speaks to their anger, speaks to their fears and their concerns. Well, does that mean that I'm suddenly sitting here endorsing Rubio? No, go back and listen to the first part of this sports cast again. The problem here is that the unprotected have risen to support a candidate that is not worthy of them. That's the tragedy here. How do we get by it? Hell, I don't know. But here's your candidate, Donald Trump. He's going to make America great again. He's going to build a wall. He's going to build a wall that's 10 foot higher now that a former president of Mexico, Vincente Fox, effectively, pardon my French again, told Donald Trump that he could take his idea that Mexico, well, here's what he said, fuck you to Donald Trump. I don't know how to say that in Spanish. And then Donald Trump said, okay, that's it. I'm going to make the wall 10 feet higher. But did you really listen to Donald Trump? in that debate last night. Did he have one cogent policy position? He was rattled. He was flustered for most of the debate. All he could do was hurl insults. Hugh Hewitt, one of the questioners last night. Uh, I know Hewitt somewhat. Great guy, polite, always generous. Hugh Hewitt feels very strongly about the issue of ethics and on his radio show, you will often hear discussions in that regard. He had Donald Trump on as a guest. I forget when. It was before Donald Trump declared for the presidency, and he asked Donald Trump about his tax returns. Will you release your tax returns if you announce your run for president? And Donald Trump said, yes, I'll do so immediately. 
So Hugh Hewitt was one of the questioners last night, and he brought that up. Here's a clip. Again, you know when I do this uh, capture and patch, putting audio into the boardscast, it always sounds tinny, but you will be here. You will be able to hear what Donald Trump said to Hugh Hewitt. Yeah, Donald Trump did promise to release his tax returns, and Hugh Hewitt brought that up last night in the debate. What is Donald Trump's first reaction? Well, Hugh Hewitt has pretty much nailed me, so I have to insult him. Listen to this. Mr. Jeff, no, 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 no. a year ago, you told me on my radio show, the audio and the transcript are out there on YouTube, that you would release your tax returns. True. Are you going back on your No, I'm commitment? not. First of all, very few people listen to your radio show. That's the good news. Let me just tell you. Let me just, which, which happens to be true. Check out the ratings. Now, what phrase comes to your mind right now? The one that comes to my mind is, what an asshole. Okay, Hugh Hewitt asked a very legitimate question. It was a question that challenged Donald Trump, a question that was somewhat embarrassing to Donald Trump. All Donald Trump could think of in response was to that question was to deliver an insult. That guy asked me a question, so I'm going to insult. It's the same thing he did with Megyn Kelly. Megyn Kelly's question was perfectly legitimate about some of the previous statements that Donald Trump had made. So what does he do? Oh, she had blood coming out of her whatever. You know what that meant. That meant, oh, Megyn Kelly must have been on her, period. This is the champion of the unprotected? Is this the best the unprotected can do? You want some more information on Donald Trump? Look, I've been doing a lot of research. Yeah, here I am at the Canyon Ranch, and all I want to do is sit in my room with a computer and a printer and do research on Donald Trump. But I have been doing it because I want to present you with some informative boardscasts. Maybe, maybe, if some of the Trump supporters have the guts, and it does take guts, to listen to this, you, you might have a reaction. You might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, I'm pissed. Yeah, I'm angry. Yes, Trump has addressed my anger. Yes, I do feel unprotected. But is there a better choice I can make in this election? the last 25 years of Donald Trump, if his record for the last 25 years is any indication, there is a 75% chance that Trump would have to declare some form of bankruptcy during his presidency. Trump has declared bankruptcy for the Trump Taj Mahal, the Trump Plaza Hotel, the Trump Plaza Casino, Trump Hotels and Casino Resorts, and Trump Entertainment Resorts. He's such a great deal maker. He's such a great businessman, and he has bankrupted all of them. When it comes to bankrupting businesses, Trump is in the bottom 5% of his peers in the corporate world. Bottom 5%. And almost all of these bankruptcy deals require Donald Trump, the master of everything, requires him to give up ownership or remove his authority to make day-to-day -day decisions for the companies. You see, these bankruptcies, these bankruptcies were reorganizational bankruptcies, where you seek protection from your creditors while you reorganize the business called a Chapter 11. They weren't liquidated. They weren't liquidations. It's not selling off all your assets and paying your creditors. It's reorganizing these Trump businesses so that they could start making money again. And in, in the agreements, in the court orders that eventually discharged these companies from bankruptcy, gave them the protection they needed from creditors. In these agreements, Trump had to either give up his ownership, get out of here, or he had to be removed from the authority to make decisions. This is a man that cannot make business decisions. And you want him with the nuclear code? You want him making Supreme Court nominations?
He is a consistent name caller, a consistent insulter, but has no consistency at all when it comes to being a good businessman. Remember, I told you a week or so ago that comparing Paris Hilton's business acumen to that of Donald Trump, Paris Hilton makes him look like he's selling pencils on a street corner. Oh, does he like to insult. How's this going to work out if Donald Trump is in the White House and a foreign leader says something about him? Rosie O'Donnell, not a foreign leader, okay, but according to Donald, she's disgusting and fat and a slob. That's the way we want our leader to talk, isn't it? That'll bring great respect and admiration for the United States. Arianna Huffington. I've known Arianna Huffington for over 20 years, and she kind of slid from being a reasonable conservative to a far left, but still, I've enjoyed my conversations with her. So, Donald Trump has to tell everybody that Arianna Huffington, after a negative article was written about her in one of his magazines, or one of her magazines, uh, well, she's very, very unattractive. Right. I fully understand why her former husband left her for a man. He made a good decision. This is Trump's reaction to a negative article in the Huffington Post. We want this man dealing with foreign leaders from the White House. Okay, so that's the way he treats Arianna Huffington, but maybe maybe he wouldn't be so rough on other politicians or political leaders, not the way he is on Hugh Hewitt or Rosie O'Donnell. Well, let's see. Uh, he's referred to Ted Cruz as a pussy. Uh, George Bush, low energy. Uh, ben Carson, super low energy. Rubio is weak like a baby. And then you remember his remarks about Carly Fiorina. Look at that face. That's a face nobody could vote for. What kind of a pig is going to make comments like that about another woman? And then, of course, there's John McCain. He's not a war hero, according to Trump. He's a loser. And I already told you about former Mexican President Vincente Fox talking about Donald Trump's wall. And, hey, we're not going to pay for that. And you can go F yourself. See, I'm trying to be nice now. Well, Trump went into a little tirade about Vincente Fox using the F word. It's a disgusting word. It's a re No, it's not. It's a very versatile word. It's a disgusting word. It's an obscene word. I never use words like that. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, unless he's talking about China and their trade policies, when he told or speaking to the Chinese saying, Listen, you mother effers, we're going to tax you 25%. That's your guy, Donald Trump. Look, once again, after reading Peggy Noonan's article, and you heard a good bit of it right here, I can completely understand the anger. I like her terms, the protected and the unprotected, and I know, I know you feel unprotected. You realize that the elite in Washington don't feel the negative effects of illegal immigration. There's nobody in the Congress, nobody in the House, nobody in the Senate, no cabinet member going to lose their job to an illegal immigrant. You don't have that protection. I understand the anger. But as I said at the very beginning of this, the biggest, the greatest power you have is the power of choice. And if you use your power of choice wrongly in this election, the consequences are going to be very long lasting. The consequences could be permanent. And are you sure that Donald Trump is the choice that you want to ride on? I'm not through. You know, we have the Super Tuesday primary coming up next Tuesday. Had that debate last night. So just a little bit more. I think I mentioned this to my Atlanta listeners at WSB in a commentary. But how about just a few more details right now? This is an article. This article was written four years ago by Wayne Barrett. Wayne Barrett. Barrett knows a little bit about Trump. Knows a little bit. He wrote a book, 1992, Trump Deals and the Downfall. Oh, Donald was going to sue him over that book. Of course, he never did because you get sued. 
You have to be put under oath. They take depositions. Eh, you don't want to be under oath saying the things in that book aren't true. So Donald backed down. Wayne Barrett writes for Newsweek, Village Voice. And four years ago, Barrett wrote an article about Trump prior to Trump's presidential run. Wait a minute. You said four years ago. Yeah, maybe you forgot. Four years ago, Trump was going to run for president. Now, at that time, and before Trump announced his run, Wayne Barrett wrote this article. And the article had some pretty juicy information about Donald Trump and his associates. One of Donald Trump's associates. Now, look, why am I telling you this? Because the media is playing rope-a-dope right now with you, with the voters. There is nothing in Wayne Barrett's article, nothing in that book, nothing that I'm going to relate to you, relate to you, that the media doesn't know. Why aren't they reporting it? That's the rope-a-dope. They, and I've been telling you this for months, the mainstream media has the information that they need to bring your hero, Donald Trump, down. Why aren't they releasing it? Because they will save that information until it can do the most damage. When can it do the most damage? When Trump is the Republican nominee. They can release the information. They can come out with a torrent of articles about Trump's past dealings, past bankruptcies, details on who was hurt, who was not. And they will flood the news marketplace with these stories after Trump is the nominee. Why? To destroy his candidacy and to get their favorite candidate, their favored candidate, Hillary Clinton, in the White House. Now, this doesn't apply to everybody in the media, but it is the general rule. There is an absolute dedication to the cause of Hillary Clinton being the first female President of the United States, just as there was dedication to the cause of Obama being the first black president. That's why you didn't see any vetting of Barack Obama. That's why it didn't matter that there were no transcripts or writings or anything from Columbia, from Harvard, from any of those places. So what could the media be holding back? I mean, Wayne Barrett is no better than Many of these other investigative reporters, when it comes up or when it comes to digging up the garbage, how about this? One associate who was an unindicted co-conspirator in a massive 2000 stock swindle, the year 2000, one associate, he escaped prison by helping to convict 19 others, including six members of New York crime families. This associate, a Donald Trump associate, two Donald Trump associates, served prison time on cocaine charges. Here's one that someday will share all the information with you, and I guarantee you the media will. Another Donald Trump partner was prosecuted for trafficking underage girls. There was a helicopter raid on a yacht off the Turkish coast, caught him prosecuted. Then there's Trump Soho, another Trump project. His daughter, Ivanka, was, or I should say, is being sued because she made fraudulent misrepresentations about Trump Soho. See, it wasn't really a hotel, kind of a condominium project. You could rent out your condominiums, but you had to live in them 110 days a year, something like that. And there were misrepresentations made to investors about how many of these were sold. Anyway, four years ago, coming into the New Hampshire primary, because of the request for interviews and Wayne Barrett's article, Trump knew that, in his words, I had no idea I would get hammered in the way I've been hammered. Hammered by what? By the media. Before the New Hampshire primary, and then five days before that primary, he dropped out. Well, he never really officially entered, but he announced, hey, I'm not going to be running for president. Wonder why? Well, at about that time, there was a front page article in the New York Times that Trump 
was being sued by hundreds of buyers of condo projects that had his name on them. You know, in the past, I've mentioned to you that huge Trump building in Las Vegas, Nevada. It's right next to the Fashion Show Mall. I saw a Fox News reporter outside that building one time when Trump was in Las Vegas identifying that building as the Trump Hotel and Casino. Sorry, it's not a casino. It's only a hotel. Why? Trump either hasn't applied for or cannot get a gaming license in Nevada. Why not? This is just more that the media is going to dump when Trump becomes the nominee. 1992, the New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement. They oversee the licensing of casinos in Atlantic City. They got Donald Trump under oath. Do you promise to tell the truth, whole truth, and nothing but truth so help you God, right? And where you lie under oath, you can be put in jail or maybe just lose your license to practice law. That's what happened to Bill Clinton. Anyway, the New Jersey Division of Gaming Enforcement issued a 34-page report, and in that report they confirmed ties between Donald Trump and organized crime. Around that time, Trump was trying to get gaming licenses in Missouri for some of these riverboat casinos. But after this 34-page report was issued, he just withdrew that application. How'd you like to know more about that? Well, when he becomes the Republican nominee, you will. You'll know a lot more about that. Well, like I said, again, ad nauseum, the greatest power you have is your power to make choices. Right now, in this election, that power will not only affect your future, but how you exercise that power is going to affect the future of this entire nation. This has been fun. It really has been fun. Watching these huge crowds, seeing this incredible voter turnout in Nevada, in Iowa, in South Carolina, There are far more people engaged in the political process now than there have been in the last couple of elections. It's kind of heady to watch all of this, but you need to give some consideration to where this is going. If this tide doesn't turn soon, maybe by Super Tuesday, if Trump runs away with most of the delegates on Super Tuesday and then goes into some of the winner-take-all primaries on March 15th, this may be over, folks. He'll get the nomination. And then, after that deal is done, speaking of deals, the media will step forward and here will come the avalanche. What are the details of that trafficking in teenage girls on that yacht in the Mediterranean? What are the details there? What are the details of all of these condominium projects? You know, one of them was in Atlanta that went under the big Trump name on them. How many of the people that put the deposits down on that and then ended up suing? What are the details? What are the details of his connections to organized crime? You want to know? The connections are there. You'll find out. Make him the Republican nominee. Trump was on that stage last night telling you that nobody knows any more about foreign relations than he does. Nobody knows more about how to reform health care than he does, though Marco Rubio actually got him to admit that he had no plan. Nobody knows more about making deals than he does. He's the smartest guy in the room, always. That guy gets into a room with somebody like Putin from Russia, or the president of China, he walks in there thinking, I'm the smartest guy in the room. These guys have nothing on me. America is ending up being badly hurt. As Og Mandino said, one of the greatest writers I've ever known, use wisely your power of choice. Right now, I'm going to choose to run off to lunch and then go hike in the desert. We'll talk to you over the weekend. Thanks for subscribing. That's it for now. Neil is slithering back under his rock. You'll be notified by email and on Twitter when he crawls out again to share his wisdom. Thanks so much for...